Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub. If you're a student of history, imagine what fun it'd be to speak with someone who'd fought in the underground against the Nazis, someone who'd fought with the Allies on D-Day, or to help liberate a concentration camp, or someone who'd been in Beitar, had been part of Ali Abed and immigrated to pre-state Palestine, who fought in the War of Independence, who had dog tags from serving in the War of Independence in Israel, who'd actually been at the Battle of Latrun when the infant Israel Defense Forces fought unsuccessfully against the Jordanian Arab Legion in one of the bloodiest and most decisive battles of the war. If only there were still people one could find who were at these iconic moments in modern history. Well, lucky, lucky us. There is one man, a sort of Forrest Gump of the Jewish community, who actually was at every single one of these moments in history, all of them. As we take this edition of L'Chaim, he is 97 years young. It is an absolute honor for me to introduce to you Michael Taylor. Michael, it is wonderful to have you on L'Chaim. You and I have known each other a long time. Time, yes. I've wanted you on L'Chaim, and now you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. And with Michael, I'm also extremely pleased to have Michael's son, someone whom I'm proud to say has been a friend of mine for some 40 years when L'Chaim was still on radio, Shannon Taylor, who in addition to being Michael's son, is an accomplished attorney, graduated magna cum laude from Tufts, attended Hebrew University Law School, then Temple University, and among the other professional organizations he's affiliated with, Shannon Taylor is a member of the New York Jewish Lawyers Guild. Shannon also has a long resume in public relations, entertainment-related activities. He's a member of the New York Drama League, the Friars Club, the New York Players Club, and Shannon Taylor hosts his own TV show called The Conversation. My friend, welcome you. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, about here time the, here. About time. <laughs> we tried to do this for a long time, and we've done it. We are persistent. We are persistent. Per persistent. God allowed it. And I am so grateful that you would come and bring your father. Michael, I have so many questions to ask yes. you. I want to begin briefly at the beginning. You were born in Poland, correct? Poland, Warsaw. You were in Warsaw. So. Okay. When you were very young, yes, uh, your parents left Warsaw. We, well, no. We all left because of the, uh, of the, of the, of the pogrom. A pogrom occurred in yeah, Poland. In Poland. Jews. What year are we talking about here, yeah, Shannon? 1924. Two years after his birth. You were born in 22. Two. And in 24, there were the pogroms. Yes. And after the pogroms, your family left Poland. Poland. Where'd you go? We went to Brussels. Brussels. Train. By the way, you're two years old. You don't remember this, I assume. Yes, I do. Okay. He, he went with his one-year-old sister and his mother and his father, Zacharia, followed him. No. Why did Zacharia not go with him at the time? Because... Uh, is uh, illegal. He, uh, he has to go go to the army. He, Your escaped. father had to go to the army. The army. He, he tried to escape. He tried he to did. escape the army. Oh yeah. Okay. How soon after you left did your father join you? Uh, uh, a day, a day or two. Pretty soon after. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How long do you stay in Brussels? How long? Uh, ten, uh, ten years. Ten years. So you, as a young child, you grow up in Brussels. Yes. Do you have good memories about Brussels? Of course. I joined the uh, 
Bnei Akiva, religious, so, yeah, every Saturday afternoon we, we get uh, rabbis from all over and, uh, and uh, uh, talking about Israel to, to build up and have confidence to go to Israel. They're encouraging you yeah, encouraging. to go to Palestine. Yes, this, oh. this helped me. My mind was to have a Jewish state right there. Really? Yeah. You wanted a Jewish state back in the 1920s and 30s? Yeah, before the war. Okay, that's, that's remarkable. Did your mother and father share your Zionist orientation? No, just the contrary. It's a, uh, to the my, contrary? Uh, yes, because he was very religious. Yes. And the rabbi also was very religious, and they didn't care about going to Israel. You grew up in an Orthodox home yeah. in the 1920s and 30s, and the Orthodox rabbi you had yeah. was anti-Zionist. No, they waited for Moshiach. Right. Until the <laughs> Messiah comes, yeah. we're going to wait. Right. Okay, and that's what he taught your father. Right. But you, you cared about a Jewish state then. Then, yes. By the way, Michael, why do you think... You cared about a Jewish state, even though your mother and father... Because of, of, of the, uh, uh, the, the, the hate the Jews in school. Yes, anti-Semitism. And we fought uh, a little bit then. Uh, it, it wasn't pleasant. I see. You want to add anything to what your father said that you know? Why would your father have this Zionist bent even though the family in which he grew up was waiting for the Messiah? Most unfortunately, there were a lot of Orthodox leaders, rabbinate, who thought that their home was where they were stationed, whether it was from Poland to France, and they had no religious expectation of a, of a holy Israel it would be a secular state. But my father was inculcated from the beginning with the flight from Poland, with the hostility in Belgium, with the general animosity, with the ghetto they were restricted to, with the limited impoverished life they had. When he was taught there's this great ancestry of Israel, this great nationhood, and there you'll be safe. And the cusp of it was when Jabotinsky came, and even though he was stoned, my father listened to every word he said and believed the fire was burning in Europe. Did you hear Jabotinsky yourself? Yes, our group, the whole Zionist organization uh, wasn't there in a big hall. By the way, you were in Beitar. Yeah, no, in Beitar. Was, our uh, youth group. Akiva. Okay. Do, is that how you get to hear Jabotinsky? Yes. Okay. What was that? I mean, this is a legend, right? Yes. I get chills even mentioning his name. What was it like to hear Vladimir Jabotinsky? It gave me the high uh, courage to go to his... Uh, what was his message? The message is that... You better go home, go go, go, uh, go to Palestine before you would. Before the doors are locked. Yeah. How old are you now? About ten. About ten. About ten years old. At ten years old, you hear Jabotinsky. Yes. And he has an impact on you. Yes. Okay. Why do you have to leave Brussels? Because uh, the German attacked us. Without. Warning war. And we had two days to, uh, to, 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 to go. To get out. To get out. Do you remember the Nazis and, and Hitler invading Belgium? Yes. Michael, are you 10 years old when. when the, no, the, 17. 17. He, he arrived in Brussels in 24. And he had to leave May 1940, so he was uh, uh, 17 at the time. He was, 10 years is when he started his education. Okay. The Nazis come. Does your, do your father and mother have the same reaction you do? 
yes. to the Nazis. Yes. It's time to leave. To leave. Your father says so also. Also, yes. And you go where? We, 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 we took a train to, 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 to France. Okay. France had not yet been invaded? No. Okay. No, it was. It was but, it had, but it hadn't lost. I'm sorry, what? It hadn't lost. It, they invaded Belgium and then immediately France, but they were able to, they hadn't done Kirk, hadn't taken place yet. So France hadn't capitulated yet. Okay. You go to France, you go to Paris. Yes. What's life like for Jews in Paris when you get there? Didn't know that it would be occupied. They didn't even realize it was no. occupied? You're right. Okay. In France, there were major deportations of Jews. Yes. At, at one point, France even helps yeah. the Nazis deport Jews. Right. You remember this? Yes. We, uh, before that, when, uh, before the, before the, uh, the uh, France was occupied, I had to go to the Polish army. You did? Yeah. In France. In France. I don't understand. Why would you be in the Polish army Because in I France? was born in Poland. Did your father have oh. to leave France to go? No, no, no. The Polish refugee army was given refuge in France. And there was a passage of time between the uh, collapse of Poland and the collapse of France where the Polish army supplemented the French army. Aha. Uh -huh. And you're in the Polish army. Well, are you are you fighting? We were treated like animals. Like like animals. Like animals. By whom? The by, Poles. by the uh, Polish because officers. Because you were Jews. Because we were all Jews. Horrible. And uh, we revolt, and the French gendarme came in, and says, if you treat it again. So we arrested you. So the French came to the assistance of the refugee Jews, who they thought would be soldiers, and told the Polish officers, if you keep baking them in the sun, and they, you're finished. They kept baking them in the sun? Yeah, they, they left them out to dry in the I sun. I spoke to the police in France. That you're they, the one who told they, them what, they, uh, yes, well, uh, what, what was they, being done yeah, to you. Right. They stay six hours in the sun, and they trap on the floor. And this is because you're Jewish? Yes. Okay. Did you in the Polish army actually fight Germans? Uh, we, we, no. They, they never trained to the point of combat. They, just when they were ready to go, uh, 300,000 or 100,000 French and the English were captured at Dunkirk, and that broke up the Polish army, and he fled to join his family in South France. So now you're with your family in South France. Yes. What happens next? Then when the France was occupied... By the Germans. By the Germans, they took us to a concentration camp. I, you were taken to a camp? Yeah, all, all, uh, all the Jews. Where, which camp? Agde. Where was that? Next to the Spanish border. Who, uh, who deported you, French or Germans? The French, all of French. Oh, wait. Michael, as you look back at this, France was part of the Allies. They were fighting the Nazis. Yes. How could they have been complicit? How could they have participated in the deportation of Jews? As you look back at it, can you make sense of it for me? Yes, because uh, France is... Uh, uh, occupied by, uh, by, by, by Hitler, and, uh, and he gave the order you take the Jews in the, in the camp. What, what, hap they did. what happened was the, uh, the French prime minister and president wanted to fight, but Pétain, who was brought in as a symbol of World War I greatness, wanted to surrender right away. And, he, and, and Churchill said, how can you surrender? You got to do something. And they said, we can do nothing. And they never anticipated that within six weeks, shorter than the resistance of the Warsaw Ghetto, that France would collapse. 
The French had lost one out of every ten men in World War I. They didn't want to do it again. They hated the Jews all their lives. They hated Dreyfus, and the Dreyfus case was of recent memory. And the Germans said, one thing, do us a favor, get rid of the Jews. And they were all too happy. Everybody who ran the trains were volunteer Frenchmen. Every, they were paid bonuses. If you didn't want to do it, you lost your job, and you went into poverty and died in obscurity. And as far as Patan, he loved working with the Germans. That's why he was hung after. Most of the French who agreed, who were of the upper echelon, had a wonderful life with the Germans. De Gaulle fired on American ships in North Africa, but he was the only one who left France in protest to their decision. So you're in a camp now. Yes. How old are you? Roughly? Uh, 17. You're 17. A lot happened to you at 17. Yeah. You're now in a, in a concentration camp. Yes. And uh, what, what's your life like there? It, it, it was um, the concentration camp had a wire in the middle. The women and the children went on, one side. on the right side. Yes. And the men on the left side. Yes. And this was uh, for the Jews, uh, death right there. Because it was a death sentence. Be yeah, because the Jewish people in general, they lived with his family. The family is the main thing. And here, they made it. They destroyed the family. The family yeah. And they need help. Let's see my... Uh, uh, my, my mother with four children, it was terrible, awful, a the whole night, screaming. The sisters were five, seven, and nine, and they depended on their father, and they had no father now. So, the f so father and Michael are on one side. Right. And your mother and two daughters, three, two, yeah. three sisters of yours, yeah. are on the other side. Yeah. And you four sisters. Four, four sisters? Four sisters. Four sisters. There were five. Your mother plus yes, four. Yes, five kids. And how many? And were you the only son? Yes. Okay. The so you're with your father, and five of your sisters and your mother on the other side. Yes. You can't see them. No. They're lost uh, I to got, you. I, I, I was a weak, no organized. It was crazy. Think, uh, it was yes. chaotic. Yeah. Um, was this a concentration camp Ca or a death camp? No. Not a death camp. camp. No. Okay. Do yeah. you remember what you did or felt when you were now I, uh, in the well, camp? I, uh, I, uh, I screamed to the police for the brutality, and uh, he, wants, uh, he, he wants to kill me, so I escape. How did you escape? And the, uh, and the, and the people going going to is the camp. Explain. There were two camps. There was a process. The reason the Jews came to the death camps eventually uh, unable to fight, uh, basically, is because it was a process of winnowing them down, starving them, separating from their families, humiliating them, beating them, stripping them, uh, no recourse. The outside world's not there, the inside world's not there. Agda led to Riversalt. Riversalt was right on the border with Spain. You froze in winter, you burned in the summer. The three youngest sisters wouldn't have made it. So from the Jewish underground, a lady came, knew the father would never give permission, went to the mother, one parent could sign, and they were sent up to the north for rescue as hidden Catholics, where they remained as hidden children throughout the rest of the world. Let me make sure I understand. You're saying that Michael's sisters were saved by someone who then hid them as Catholics. Right, three of them, the youngest. But, how, Shannon, how did they get them out of the camp? She has a paper for the government. The woman the, who came? Yes. I see. Bl uh, only sh little children who, 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 who cannot manage anymore, she took. Okay. You had four sisters. What happened to the fourth sister? They took in the Catholic. Also? Also. All four sisters? Yes. But the fourth was separated. No, they separated. Malka, the youngest, five years old, went to Paris, and Marcel Marceau, the famous mime, 
was her scout, her guardian. Really? That's where he learned his trade. They were <laughs> lifelong friends. The other uh, middle two, uh, Rivka and Chava, were sent to a chateau, which my wife and I visited on our honeymoon years later and saw their names scratched into the stove of Shenem. So, and the fourth Sarah was, was kept in the south because she was one year younger than him and yes. able to work. By the way, they were very lucky, were they not? Yes, but my father didn't like it. Because? Because they were Becoming Catholic. Catholic, yes. He was horrified. Must have been very painful for yeah, your father. very painful. Yes. Um, they're in the camp. Yes. Your father's on one side with his father. Right. And his mother and his sisters are on the other side. Right, and three get out. And he says he escaped. What no. does he mean he escaped? No, what happened? No, no, not from, escaped. From Riverzolt, from the second camp. The second camp. He escaped twice. He was in the well, camp. What about the first camp? The first camp was a work camp. And the work camp then transferred them all to Riverzolt. When all, including the sisters? Yes. It was a process. Ah. It was a winnowing process. I see. First, you make you think you're going to live and you're going to work. Then, when you're all worked out, then they shove you into this camp with hundreds of thousands of people and, and the Spanish Republicans were the first to be deported and then the Cath and the Jews. But they knew the young Jewish kids, the French underground was busy. From, of all Jews, since the beginning, they knew they had to get out the youngest. And so they were able to persuade the mothers to save the kids. The fathers would never. Uh, and then towards the end of the war, after he had escaped twice from the Riversault camp and had 25 different families escape with him each time, he finally had a final escape with his parents. The father said, I'm not going. I believe the law will protect me. And my wife is too sick. His elder sister said, I have to stay with the mother. She was in the resistance too. And he went off on his own into the fields and fought in the resistance until the Allied forces on D-Day. And then when D-Day took place, and he had uh, captured a train and gotten armor and did his part, then they gave him a furlough to find his sisters. And he went to Paris where he knew one was. And the Jewish underground had kept tabs on her because they had to move day by day, week by week. They never knew when they were going to be caught. The movie with Quentin Tarantino and Glorious Bastards shows Barbie going after kids. And he was in the resistance fighting Barbie all those years. And Barbie sent 20,000 Catholics and 30,000 Jewish kids to Auschwitz. Uh, that was his job as a chief of police in Lyon. But by the time the Allies came and liberated the North, and he was successful in liberating the South, he had the chance to get Malka, who didn't recognize him didn't know from him, was a Catholic. She was five years, she was 10 years old now, saw his uniform, was frightened. He persuaded her, was a brother. And then the American army took him to find the other two sisters where they were still fighting with the Germans. And under fighting with the Germans at the chateau, he came to them and, and also the same process, a uniform and so, but he got them on a truck to meet Malka prearranged. And then he had to go back to fight in the South. Okay. For most Americans, American Jews as well, the story you told, however, you leapt, you, you jumped us a piece which we don't understand the history of. What I understand is your father's in a, in a work camp. At and at some point, he's moved One year from later. a work camp to a what camp? To a concentration camp. It's, it's, it's a work concentration camp. Still not a death camp. No. No. He's moved. Yes. What's his life like there? I save 50 people out there. What's uh, your uh, life uh, like? Uh, what is your life like there? There? Very bad. Why? How? Well, uh, it wasn't enough food. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, we were starving. Is this your entire family in this camp? Your father, your mother, and your sisters as well? Are in they the, all in the camp? In the beginning, yeah. yes. Okay. And you escaped from this camp? Yes. How? Because I, I safe, uh, I know how to... Uh, you dug under station. the wire. Yeah. You dug under the wire? Yeah. And you took people with you? Yeah. You were the leader? 
Yeah, I was the leader. By the way, you did a lot of no, that. No, I wasn't. They, they had, they had a, 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 a committee. committee. A committee. Co yeah. But, uh, and then those who wants to go and get out, they, uh, I, I, I ta take them. Okay. You know, Shannon, very often we only hear about the Jews going meekly. It sounds like your father was always in some kind of group that was really saying, we're not taking this, and we're going to in some way resist or escape. Am I correct? Absolutely correct. It is the biggest canard. There was more Jewish resistance against the Nazis across Europe than any other group. More than half the countries, more than all of France. The Czechoslovakia was emasculated by the, by the Allies before the war. And the Jews fought more than England did before the war. And with nothing, with no clothes, with no food, with no water, with no hope, with no Israel, with no allies, with nothing from the outside coming in, they formed their own committees, their own groups. Who is able to take these people out? You are, you try and do it. Okay, so you take a group out, but they capture you again, correct? Yes. He was, in, he was in the woods. You were in the woods, yeah. and they found you. Yeah. And they brought you back. Yeah. And they punished you by putting you in solitary. Yes. Ten days. Ten days. But okay. you survived. Yeah, I survived. Okay. Then and then now you say, I'm going to do this again. Yes. And you do. He did. And okay. I took another 25. Another 25. Five, five. Were all 25 of you brought back the first time? Just him. You're the yeah, only I, one. I, 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 I came the back. other 25 got out? He, yes. And they brought you back? Yeah. Now you take another 25 out. Yes. You're captured again. Yes. What about the other 25? Did they get out? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. You're brought back again. Yeah. How do they punish you the second time? He knocked out his teeth. <laughs> really? Yes. Uh, uh, a Jewish capo. A Jewish capo? Yeah. Knocked out your teeth. Yes. Yeah, because he, he wants to uh, be the manager. He wants to impress the Nazis. Yes, to impress. Okay. So, uh, but you survived that beating. Uh, yes, they jumped on him, and they told him, told me to beat him. I say I cannot beat a Jew. Okay, so you're brought back a second time. Yeah. And then, how do you ultimately get out of the camp a third time? It uh, it was. First, the transport was the, the, the uh, gypsy. Yes. To the death camp. The gypsies were taken to the death camp? Yes. Before the Jews? Before the Jews. The, Did you know they were being taken to a death camp? Yes. I heard. He heard that they were at the yeah. death camp. Because very That's often, right. survivors tell us that at the time, at first they didn't realize. It, it's September of uh, 42, when his parents and sister were taken, he had uh, managed to escape with just them three months before. When they got out, the news was plentiful that all over Europe, Jews were being taken with a final solution, and they weren't coming back. So he knew something. And then uh, before they took his parents as uh, non-citizens, they took the, the gypsies, then the Spanish Republicans who had opposed oh, Franco, second, yeah. and then they got the Jews. This is from the camp he's in. Yes, and France was the first country to deport non-citizens to their death, and the first to deport then citizens six months later in June. And they deport you? No, I escaped. You escaped before deportation? Yes. I knew it, it, they're going to, to death camp. Okay. And do you escape with your parents? No. Only you? Only me. So and my sister, uh, uh, a year, a year, uh, younger than me, she, she, uh, she uh, went to help the, my parents. She stayed by, with your parents? Yes. Did your parents survive? No. All three. All three camp. of them? The sister? Yes. And your parents? Yeah. We're we'll uh, ultimately taken to a uh, death camp. To Auschwitz. To Auschwitz. Yeah. I'm so sorry. 
and, and it's recorded in Serge Klausfeld's compendium, which is at Yad Vashem, and that's the world authority for the Jews killed by the French. And there's a page that shows the family named Tushneider, Zachariah, Esther, and Sarah, deported September 1242 and executed one week later. And he didn't know that until at the end of the war, he went to Brussels for his home and nobody came back. And he realized he has a sole responsibility for his surviving sisters. Who were at that point were being taken care of by Catholics. Right. Okay. So you do escape. Yes. And what uh, do you do then? Uh, I joined the Jewish uh, resistance. resistance. There, uh, uh, can you help me? What is the Jewish resistance at that point in time? At that point, it was 15 French resistance. And we uh, develop up, up, up to 75. People? People. All Jews? Or All no? Jews. All Jews. Yes. But French but Jews? Part, but part, there was uh, a Gentile too. But mostly the work done was the Jews. Okay. And you were a po you came from Poland. Yeah. Are you seen as a Polish Jew then? Yeah. How are you regarded by the other people in the it Jewish do, underground? Doesn't matter. Doesn't We're, matter. No. Okay. We're all uh, the same. All the same. Yeah. And what do you do? What does the Jewish underground actually do? Uh, Did you actually fight? Yes, sure. Sure. We, yes. yes. We, we uh, liberated two towns. We. Uh, we uh, uh, a train of Germans uh, knew knew they were going to pass by if we did dynamite, and we blew up the train. German, the German train. Wow. Yes, and the whole night we fought. In the morning they gave it up. And uh, did your friends die? A lot, I put quite a few people. So. Were you ever injured? No. Just by luck? Yes, just by luck. By luck. And how long does your father fight in the Jewish underground? Two years in the camp, three years in the French resistance. What do you mean in the camp? Before he could, before the third escape, he was two years in Riverside. Yes, but I'm, he wasn't part of the underground then. No. Okay. But, but there was an underground. But he wasn't part of it. No, but when he left, interestingly enough, he didn't know where to go. So he just, he had a vision from God that he had a vision when he was very young that said, you must exist to save your people and save your family. You had that vision? Yes. When you were how old? Well, Roughly. I was uh, 20, 24, 25, 20, Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then he found uh, a Lyon which was the capital of southern France, and he saw a thousand Jewish kids all there in the streets. And he went to the leadership and the rabbis and said, you must do something, they're coming. I know they're coming to take them the next day. And they said, we have no more room, maybe you can sit. So he saved about 24 and hid them somewhere. And then he said to the rabbi, you have to come into the fields with me with everybody. The rabbi says, I'm not an animal, and the Jews here are not animals. He says, well, I'm going to be the animal. I'm going into the fields. Came back the next morning. Everybody was deported. Everybody. All the kids, except the citizens, which included the rabbi. And then they were taking more trains. The citizens were left. The citizens were left. These were all so refugees. the rabbi was there now, but all the children were gone. And he was crying, said, you were right, you were right. And so my father had only one chance to escape before they were continuing the deportations, and he hopped on one of the trains by pushing a six-foot-five SS guard fully armed to the ground. And, and he jumped on the train. The guard was so shocked that you pushed him that he said, come back, come back, and my father told him what he could do. What train were you jumping on to? Uh, it, went, it went to Lyon. It went to Lyon. Yeah. And uh, the reason that the... Uh, he was trying to stop me. He, 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 saw, he saw that, that I go to Lyon in, in the Jewish group, 
for Wales and the all Wales and and, 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 uh, and tell them to the, to, to, to get, get it out because tonight they can come to, to take you. You were going to warn them. Yeah. Yes. So you go to Lyon. Yes, I went to Lyon. Okay. And and I met the uh, commander of that. Is that the, when you joined the Jewish underground, the Jewish no, resistance? No. Uh, Yes, no, it's all the same thing. You're already in the Jewish, yeah. okay. So you're in the Jewish underground. Yeah, you continue to fight. Yes. Until, um, uh, until the D-Day. You remember D-Day? Day, yes. But you don't know D-Day is going to happen, do you? Uh, yeah, almost. Yes. You see it coming, sort yeah, because of? the radio, it, uh, we have a connection. Where are you on D-Day? D-Day uh, in France. In France? Yeah. Okay. But where in France? In, in the middle of France. In the middle of France? Yeah. And you hear what's happening? Yes. On the beaches of um, Omaha Beach, etc.? Yeah. Many, many, many people, many soldiers died. Yes. Trying to storm that beach. Uh, I did. First, the, 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 the soldiers, the German soldiers attacked us in the DD day. Luckily, they had the order to come back and to, to regroup to, to fight the American. Yes. So it saved my life. <laughs> I understand. I understand. By that time, they were fed up with the resistance, and they were going to finish them off because they were the reconnaissance, the intelligence, the supply lines. They gave all the information to England and America, and they also went to Monaco and Switzerland and so on, uh, uh, secretively keeping up resistance going all there. And the Germans were fed up, but came D-Day just in time. And, f and they let the, the uh, resistance know uh, with uh, code. And uh, they said, we're sending seven paratroopers. And the paratroopers came down after they had captured more trains and gotten the weapon and then had them eventually join the Allied forces, which would be the uh, French and American armies under the Allied Liberation Forces. So you become part of the Allied forces? The American uh, Army. You are in the American Army? Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, before uh, I was on the American Army, I had a follow of 10 days to look for my sisters. And uh, one of the girls told me that she knows where my sisters are. And I went to see them. They were, had been living as Catholics. Catholics. Did they develop a Catholic identity, or did they stay Jews? No, they, they stay Catholics. That's at that time. Did they change at yes. some point? Yes, yes. They did. At yeah. what point did they change and why? My father told them, you're Jews, I'm your brother, <laughs> and that, that's it. And the eldest, Ava, says, I learned dance, I learned singing, I learned to dress. Where do you want us to go? And he said, I want you to learn a new language, Hebrew, and I want you to go on a boat. I'll make legal passage, and we're going to go across the Mediterranean where we have Palestine. She says, They're killing, the British are killing the Jews, the Arabs are killing the Jews. The mother superior started to shriek. Well, you're going to take your three young sisters, and finally they lived, and bring them over there. Are you out of your mind? And he had to go and be his own lawyer, and get 10 witnesses to sign he was a brother, and the French court gave him guardianship. And then he took the three sisters, who by that time realized he's in charge of them, and the rest of their lives was a warped way because they saw him as their father instead of as the brother. And uh, the eldest was very, very pretty. She became a runner-up to Miss Israel in, in 49. She went to the opera. They all became soldiers, sergeants. Malka, the youngest, became a sergeant. They have families of hundreds there now. They, and they went to Canada and established the first nail salon. And, and, uh, and they now live in Matula, where they're surrounded by underground tunnels <laughs> showing up at their doorstep from under Syria and Lebanon. And they don't care. Because they've been through all this, and any time we ask them, 
They say, everything is fine, everything <laughs> is fine. I grew up knowing about Kirit Shmona being bombed by the first Arafat PLO terrorism, by the kindergarten being taken over. They lived in bunkers, and we would call up, everything is fine, everything is fine. And that was his attitude. That was his attitude throughout. And when he finally got the sisters to accept him, he got four legal passages, unheard of, four legal passages from the British who hated the Jews and the captain of the Matarua, a very famous ship that took them to Israel, had Ruth Westheimer on board with 200 other children from Switzerland. When we came to the boat, I saw about 50 uh, people, young uh, Want, uh, want to go to, to Palestine, but they didn't have the papers. So uh, I uh, took the, uh, the certificate from my sisters and I distributed it. And, and, and I did about two, three, three times. And the guards saw me doing that. The Jewish Brigade, the Jewish brigade and disguise, brigade. Helping, helping Jews get to Israel. And he was the means that they adopted. He, he told me in Yiddish, bring me food to the kids. <laughs> bring as many as you can. And, and, uh, and I, brought, I brought about uh, over 50 people. And they all live today in Israel, with families and everything. But what he a took story. a chance yes. because each certificate might not have come back to him and him and his sisters but, might not have gotten on the boat. In essence, yeah. you used your passes yes. over just, and over again, over again to get other people onto I, this boat. Yeah. And you sailed to Palestine. Yeah. By the way, you're on a boat that has the right to land in Palestine. Yes. You did not have to run the blockade. No. You were on a kosher boat. Yes. Okay. When you say that the British were hard on the Jews. Yeah. First of all, I don't I don't I don't believe that you mean to tell me that they were as bad as the people you had to live with. But they still made your life unpleasant, correct? Britain had a terrible <laughs> occupation. They didn't want to surrender Israel. Menachem Begin and the Agun and the Stern forced their hand. They already had a million people there. My father was part of the resistance to the Arab reprisals. They were encouraging all the time. The Jews had no guns. They gave it all to the Arabs, and they told the Arabs, help us get rid of the Jews. They had strict curfews for Jews. They discouraged every Jewish movement. And they, at, finally, when they couldn't, that survived the explosion of the King David Hotel, it was too embarrassing, and they had tired of hanging Jews because now British were being hung. They couldn't invade Israel, so they took their 100,000 people and they left, and they hoped the UN would get rid of Israel. But the UN said a Palestinian state and an Israeli state. It's an Arab state, not a Palestinian but state. An Arab state and a... I understand. When you, after you arrive in Palestine, you had been in a group that was, in essence, related to Beitar. You had heard Jabotinsky. Yes. You have fought and fought and escaped and fought. Yeah. Did you join the Irgun, the Haganah, what? No, no, no. you joined the Haganah. Uh, Haganah. You joined the Haganah. Uh, yeah. The Haganah fought against the Irgun. Yeah. When you were with the Haganah, did you, was your enemy also the Irgun? <laughs> They were uh, friends. You were friends? Yeah. Okay. Do you remember when the Irgun blew up the King David Hotel? Yes, I was there. What do you mean you were there? Yeah. Where Jerusalem. were you? Jerusalem. You were? Yes. Okay. You were not part of the operation? No. But you were in Jerusalem? Jerusalem. Okay. Uh, what was that like? What did people, what did Jews feel like when the, when the King David blew up? Terrific. Why? To show that we can fight, mm -hmm. regardless what. Did you feel the Jews were going to win? Yes. You never worried the British would no. win? No. You always knew one day the British would get up and leave? Right. Okay. And then they do. Yeah. You remember that? Right. Do you remember the day that David Ben-Gurion read the Declaration of Independence? Yes. Where were you? 
I, I was in Tel Aviv. <laughs> <laughs> You're everywhere, aren't you? You heard me call you that you are the Forrest Gump of Jewish history. Yeah. You're always there. Yeah. That must have been a very exciting day. And when we danced, when Ben Gurion said to declare a Jewish state, we danced on the, on the street. You danced on the street? See. Okay. He, he was in the Independence uh, March. And then the next day, yeah. it actually started the day before. But the way it's told is the next day, six Arab nations yeah. go to war to destroy the infant Jewish state. Yes. Where are you? I joined the, the um, Givati. Givati, this is the strongest army in Jerusalem. And we fought there. And we won the war. Next day, we parade. And we declare Jewish state. Yes. These are your tags. Yeah. You wore these. Yes. During your time. Yeah. Fighting with, 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 with the, the Israel Asian. Defense Forces yes. right. to make a Jewish state. Yeah. Nine months. Nine months. Then you built a life in Israel, did you not? You lived in Israel. In Israel, the whole time. Okay. How did you meet your wife? I want your, I want your son to tell the story. How did your mother and father meet? Uh, only, only typical with this family. <laughs> uh, my mother was a Hunter College graduate, a Juilliard, Juilliard College pianist, and she was an administrator at Cooney. And she was 28, and her aunt became Pioneer Woman of the Year for selling the most trees. And she said to my mother, you need a husband. And she said, we're going to Israel. And my mother said, what am I going to find over there? And she, and she said, first we'll go to Rome and London. We came to Israel. She says, it's magnificent. It's beautiful. It's pristine. But I don't want Shmuel. I don't want, I don't want Akiva. I don't want the religious person. I don't want the derelict on the street. I've got to find for myself. And uh, I don't care how much money they have or any. I want to find the love her for myself. So she says, I'll look in the newspaper. So she goes to this store, and she meets my father, who was a stud, and, <laughs> and uh, knew he was a stud, and a ladies' man, and uh, finally talking in Yiddish, and they were both master dancers, and loved to dance, and athletes. And they danced for a month until they married in a month in Jerusalem. They didn't even know if they had a rabbi. The rabbi never showed. They grabbed the first guy on the street. They said, you're a rabbi, and, and all his sisters are crying. You're going to leave us. And, and, and my mother's aunt is saying, you should have married Shmuel. <laughs> and, and, and meanwhile, the sisters took everything they got for the wedding. And uh, approximately a, a month after that, my mother had to return to her job. And she waited, and she waited, and all her family are going crazy because he could not come in to the United States with a Polish name named Tuschneider. That was the Cold War. It was the 50s. So her, her cousin Eli and her cousin Arthur, who worked in the State Department and the Navy, said, change, translate the name, whatever it is, translate it. Tuschneider is a master tailor. He became Michael Taylor, and in two weeks, he was in America, <laughs> greeted the uh, Statue of Liberty with the greatest of uh, happiness, and saw my mother, who almost swooned, uh, and ended up praying in Passaic, New Jersey, at a synagogue where his cousins happened to have survived as well, and they both fainted there <laughs> on the ground, and he became an entrepreneur. My mother knew he, he was not fit for a factory or anything, and her father, David Feller, brought a hardware store that was going down. He built it up, and the person who sold it to him got uh, angry and built another hardware store in the next town, got more angry when he was still successful, and built one right opposite him. And so he spent the next 50 years surrounded by hardware stores, <laughs> building his own bigger and bigger and bigger, until Lowy's came and the big box store at the Home Depot came, and he couldn't come, and after 60 years, he retired. His store became a landmark. It's, uh, they, uh, the people who came for customers were all Germans <laughs> and Italians. This was the heart of the Bund. This was the heart of the anti-American sentiment pro-German. 
but when he was featured on all the national news and the national newspapers for having been somebody who had resisted Klaus Barbie when Barbie was uh, taken out of Argentina by the Klausfelds and put on trial in France, the great butcher of Lyon, the most famous Gestapo person in Europe, and he was a witness. All of them emptied their attics, brought their books and their papers. Their wives said it was true. They said, yes, it's true. You see him on TV, our Mike. And the, and, and the Germans came and the Nazis came. And everybody came to salute him and honor him. And, and the town where we lived in Paramus and then the New Jersey Senate and then the largest Jewish organizations and the Christian more than the Jewish. Uh, and uh, eventually proclamations from everywhere and from John Jay, and he became a lecture scholar in the courts where I worked uh, for Holocaust programs. He, he instituted a lot of them. He was at the first gatherings in Washington with President Reagan and in Philadelphia. And uh, he scheduled again to be honored in Washington in April with all the agencies for the Holocaust. Thank you. Mazal tov to you. Mazal tov. You know, if you made a movie of your father's life, no one would believe it. It was like he was a superhero because he was in horrible situations and he refused to accept them. Time and time again, your father said no to whatever kind of brutality was being done to Jews all around him. How do you, where do you think that comes from? What is it about your father that his entire life from the time he was then to 17, then 24, then going to, you know, fighting with the Allies, fighting with the underground, fighting with the Jewish resistance, fighting with the Haganah, fighting against the British. This is your, and your father says, I'm going to save 25 members of this camp twice. I'm going to make sure 50 kids get on a boat to Palestine by passing around these four passages that I have. This is an unusual human being. For all of the credit your father has with, you know, we have all these medals here on the desk that you have for your father. Some of them. So, only some of them. What's this one? That was from the, his uh, annual honoring on the Intrepid by the uh, fleet commander. Michael is honored every year in New York on the Intrepid. It's not about the medals. It's about you, who your father is. That's why there are the medals. I'm asking you a serious question. How do you understand your father that, where does it come from inside a human being? In this instance, this happens to be your father. But what do you think, Shannon, happens inside a human being that creates the kind of character that your father had from the time he was a child? I can answer that this way. My father is of the personality that he is always strong, always a leader, always courageous. He's an independent thinker. He's an independent soul. He, he they didn't listen to everybody around him. He thought what was right. He listened to what was right, and he acted on what yes, he thought he was where right. Where does that come from? That came, no question, from Yabotinsky. It came from from really studying our heroes in the Bible. It, it came from his own gene, the longevity gene, which uh, per, says you're not going to get sick. There are certain outstanding people who can last and who can fight. I have it only in emergencies. For instance, when Rabbi Meir Kahana of was, was assassinated, I chased after him with a camera. I didn't have the intelligence of my father to get a gun. After the assassin. Right, right after the assassin. And no seer and got photographed so they have evidence at trial. In front of me was a teenager who did the same thing, and this guy was pointing his gun at us. There is something for emergencies that many Jews or everybody can react. The idea that you do it all the time, that you have it in you all the time, that no, nobody is going to knock him out, as he says. No, no competition is going to get the better of him. This zeal, this ambition, this drive, this power, I don't have. I have. But he has, and I can't account for it except from a Jewish spirit that goes back to the Maccabees. Listen, 
you have a very special neshama. It comes from somewhere, and you know, I say this in the spirit of the Jewish tradition. It comes from God. Somehow, you were just blessed, yeah. and you responded. You know, there's the the midrash of Nachshon ben Aminadab, yeah. who goes into the Red Sea and the Red Sea splits. You're Nachshon. You split seas. All your life, you split seas. Your life has been the quintessential Maccabee. You are an inspiration to us, my dear friend. And this was wonderful for you to come and tell your story. And you have an extraordinary son. And that doesn't happen by accident. It's also a gift from you. Torah Rabbah. Torah Rabbah. Kol we will be together again, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. And you, my dear friend, thank you for sharing your father with us. You are so much of who you are because of your father. And you have done extraordinary things with your life. And there's a, you have a, you're a large personality in the best sense of the word. And you always have a home with me. And I love you very much. You too. You and your family. I'm moving in now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Call not through. leaving you. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you both. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Thank you both. You are a great pioneer and a good judge of character. <laughs> so there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed meeting Michael Taylor, an extraordinary, not simply a witness to, but a participant in some of the most important moments in the history of modern Jewish life. And then his wonderful son, Shannon, who not only represents his father's legacy, but has done so much for contemporary Jewish life in his own right. It was a real pleasure for me to introduce both of them to you. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas you heard here on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I love hearing from you. And if you want to be in touch with Michael Taylor, you send me an email, and I will forward it on to him. By the way, remember now that you can listen to L'Chaim podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can take L'Chaim with you wherever you go, podcast L'Chaim. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub, L'Chaim, my friends, to life. education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.